Okay, uh, so that was a bit of a fight with the system. Um, so this time I'm not going to show the uh, you know syllabus page. I mean we are on March 14th. I don't want to switch between tabs. Um, we have about three more lectures uh, remaining, uh, lecture sessions, but we have two sessions dedicated to project presentations. So I really want uh, folks to do a good job and. and your peers will see what you've done. So I hope that's a little bit of pressure to um, try to do, try to execute the project plan you had. And you have discussed that with me before, um, but it really, that should be at the back of your mind as much as possible because assignments, you know, relatively speaking, they're easy. Okay, they, are, they kind of really point out exactly what you need to do and they are narrow in scope. And so you pretty much just do that. But with project, you have a lot more creativity so just reminding that do try to bring that creativity uh, as much as possible. Um, and uh, so that's about projects. Assignment uh, submission dates have been moved by one day for assignment four and five. So it's just Monday night. Um, I, you know, certainly it's going to interfere with this in lecture hours, but I would say try to finish it as much as possible. Uh, if you can finish it on Sunday, as usual, your cadence, then just do it because why why consume another working day right um so that's those are the changes and uh, there was a minor typo on the last date uh, it was 20, instead of 28 uh, it's now 25th okay so it's just uh, 28 is not the day uh, 25th is the day for our, our class okay anyway that's uh logistics now let's come back to uh, where we left off last time so today's agenda is really you know we have been spending quite a bit of time on relatively elementary models Okay, so logic regression model or uh, linear regression model um, yeah. or decision trees, again, okay, and you know, the way we've have, we have kind of went about it is really pick the simplest models and really try to understand all the things that can go wrong. And you can imagine if you have a pretty complicated model, you know, a lot of things can, uh, you know, be not correct. Uh, recently, we've been looking at some ways to do model selection and assessment. And uh, at least on the selection side, uh, the approach that we saw uh, is one is holdout cross holdout validation, and the other one is uh, careful cross validation. Uh, in fact, last time uh, I'm not going to look at the slides of what this discussed last time, you know, except for getting to the ROC and the transition. But uh, we'll we kind of also we got you know with holdout validation, which is the cleanest idea. Okay, careful cross validation is also a really nice practical idea. But in terms of analyzing why does it work, it you know it's hard. Okay, of course. Uh, uh, Theory folks may have solutions there, but in general, it's like uh, not very easy to reason why k fold cross validation works. Okay. I mean, you can talk about hey, if the number of data points is large, then k fold cross validation is a good example, good proxy for test error and so on. But the cleanest version was the holdout version, where one part of the data was used to train the model and then it's fixed, and then other part of the data uh, was used to kind of quantify the model, like uh, validation score. And then uh, we also talked about doing hypothesis testing, uh, basically, uh, uh, not just hypothesis testing, sorry, we talked about doing, uh, getting constant band around the true performance of the model, given an estimate of uh, its performance in validation. So that's an estimate, okay, given the derived data, but that estimate is like a point estimate. What we want is uh, what is called a, um, I guess, interval estimate. And so that's exactly what a constant interval is. So under under an assumption, normality assumption, uh, from what we've done is basically use validation data to get two numbers instead of one number. So one number is of course the uh, error validation. So it's a single point estimate. Instead of that, from validation data, you can get two numbers. And of course, in between, you can compute the single number as well as a way to get the band, I get these two numbers. But once you get these two numbers, you're saying basically that 
you know, um, they give you a high confidence, uh, you know, claim that, hey, in, in reality, the true performance of the model is somewhere in between these two, or, or sorry, these two numbers kind of cover the true performance of the model 95% of the time. So you can kind of reliably think of, you know, for example, the model will not do worse than, for example, the lower bound or things like that. Okay. Um, so that's, that's that nuance is what we covered. And that's, you know, uh, something that maybe, you know, is, is uh, not something covered when you really look at a breadth of models, you know, irrespective of change your, changing your model condition trees to random forest, which we're not covered in this course, but if you change from random forest to something else like grain boosting machines or something else, it's the same idea. Okay. Um, and then we saw some other metrics. So we said, uh, okay, this is testing uh, some out of uh, sample validation uh, with k full cross validation being the last thing we saw. And then we said, okay, let's not talk about metrics themselves. Okay, why, why only care about accuracy? Right? Um, so, for example, in the k full cross validation loop, you can only report accuracy if you want uh, on the whole dot fold and then take an average. But instead of that, instead of reporting accuracy, maybe you want to look at uh, some other numbers. Uh, and so that led to a discussion last time and quite a long discussion on confusion matrix, okay? Uh, true positives, uh, false positives, uh, false negatives, and, and true negatives. And then some functions of them, okay? The true positive rate and uh, false positive rate, okay? The two uh, rates, which are just ratios of, some ratios of the numbers, we'll talk about that in, again in a second. And then we kind of looked at a rock curve. Uh, you've done this in, already in assignment two, but uh, uh, assignment three. Um, but uh, uh, but we kind of really you know spend, spend a little bit more time on hey how do rockers again come out so they come when you have a slightly you know less specified classifier so when a, when a classifier produces numbers instead of directly a class like uh, for example the probability of being in class or a score then you can have an extra parameter which is like a threshold where you threshold and then say if the score is higher or the probability is higher than a threshold then it's about to class otherwise otherwise it's negative class okay. So these sets of uh, classifiers are not fully specified. They're only fully specified when you kind of also say, say what the threshold you're using is, right? The only people will, will pick, hey, if it's a classifier, let me pick 0.5, for example, as a threshold. I think we, it was also part of, like, I think, assignment two when you're using linear regression for classification. Uh, so, uh, but that gives you a sense of like, you know, since we are reporting scores or probabilities, you can add uh, the thresholds and that's what, that's what gives you a finally fully determined classifier. And then that will generate a confusion matrix. It's like a scorecard. Now you can imagine every time I change the threshold, I'll get many, many such scorecards, these four numbers. And rock curl is just about tracing those, uh, you know, scorecards. Basically get a kind of Pareto, Pareto frontier because different, different confusion matrices lead to different true positive rates and true uh, false positive rates. Okay. And, uh, and, and then we looked at uh, very briefly uh, something called AUC, which is just a, uh, just the area under the curve, area under the rock curve. Okay, <laughs> and uh, and so that's where we pause. We're gonna restart from there. And today, for the first part, we look at uh, what I call precision recall curves. Okay, they're very useful. And in fact, especially if you work on, uh, if you have some experience in information retrieval area, you know, maybe uh, by chance you worked on recommendation systems or maybe search uh, web search or something. Uh, then precision recall are interesting measures they they also use. But we can also use that for uh, binary classifiers. So we've been mostly discussing about binary classifiers, by the way. And so a natural question right now, even before talking about precision recall related measures is, hey, how do I deal with rock curves type of thing for multi-class classifiers? Okay. And there's no straight answer there. Okay. Uh, it's unclear how to trade off um, nicely between, because your confusion matrix will actually be not two cross two, but let's say if you have 10 classes, then it'll be 10 cross 10. And then it's a, really a question of, hey, which class, uh, what do I care about? Uh, you know, misclassifying in one class when the truth is in the other class. So there's a lot more nuance. And this this type of, you know, model diagnostics and model assessment, you do not the first time you build a model. First time building a model is kind of easy, you know, from getting a scikit-learn package or, uh, you know, if you're using Spark Tool system, MLlib or something, or even PyTorch and stuff. So there are many, many packages, uh, stats models, uh, to get to the first model, like clean up the data, get to a first model. But then, uh, you know, as you spend months and, uh, you know, uh, years on iterating the model, the model diagnostics becomes a very important thing. So model maintenance, diagnostics and improvement uh, is, is where, you know, uh, business analysis or data scientists or data engineers or ML engineers, all these names and you know, occasions, they spend a lot of time on this, right? So otherwise, you know, your job would be done like six months and then, then you're out of contract, right? Um, so, 
Um, anyway, so coming back to our uh, uh, discussion about metrics, we look at uh, um, today in the first part. We look at uh, precision recall uh, and their um, um, and, and what the trade-offs are, and, and we'll briefly talk about hypothesis testing as well. Um, and then the next part of uh, this lecture session, and actually uh, today's session is going to skip over SVM and directly talk about just summarizing what we've seen before. Okay, so as a gateway towards generative models, we have not seen generative models. Uh, and so, I mean, some of you may already know what generative models are from other other courses. But what we'll try to do is step out of model assessment and selection, think back about what models we've seen, basically dynamic regression and variations and uh, linear regression, exponential family stuff, and then try to segue into uh, generative models. So and we're going to talk about what is the difference and some examples. So this lecture and next lecture will be about that. And slowly we'll get to learning models and hopefully towards the end uh, we'll talk about unsupervised learning if you know if you have time so that's the trajectory uh, and so if it may seem as if you're not covering a lot of that okay but that's on purpose we really want to spend more time on all the ways things can fail and intuition can fail and you know and, and also learning the formal a little bit of more professional language to talk about these things um any questions about the lay of the land so in multi-class, what would be the best way to uh, measure the model? Uh, so, I mean, beyond accuracy is, is where it becomes like a hard, hard choice. Um, so in multi-class, the thing is for binary situations, you have a sense of uh, this class imbalance. I mean, you can also have a sense of class imbalance events in multi-class, like some classes may be high and some classes may be low, a low in count. Um, a priori, there is no, at least I'm not very aware of uh, good solutions. I mean, you can always convert the multi class to a binary, uh, can compress. Uh, if you care about a particular class and every other class, you can com combine into one kind of a binary. Component. Yeah, you can, but just for the analysis analysis part, not so much about like you, you don't, you can always train a multi class class file. Um, but beyond accuracy, if you want to use rock curves, then you can do one versus all type of situation. I think you're looking at one versus all with SVMs in your assignment four. Um, otherwise, uh, I mean, people do look at confusion matrices, but that uh, you can actually use precision recall as well, uh, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, but rock curves themselves um, are harder to de define. Okay, I mean, there are actually attempts to do that. Okay, so I'm, I'm just uh, you know, uh, if you want a quick answer, there people have been trying have attempted to or. Have variations which try to address multi class situations, uh, but I am not super aware of them. Yeah. Okay, so with that, let me jump over to rock curve area. Okay. I hope this is being, uh, let me just check. Okay, there's a question. No. What is this? Uh, Anna, uh, can you hear me? People can hear me, right? Um, the recording, yes. And hello, hello, yeah. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, so good. Let me just keep this here. Um, So uh, I've not discussed. Uh, so I'm basically, I'm going to start from the summarization of Rocker, and and then uh, um, yeah, I think we had spent some time on like you know why why look at Rocker, why these alternating measures, and it's exactly because not just because of class imbalance, but also because of this other reason where sometimes your cost of being uh, uh, wrong when the ground truth is you know something else, you know the off diagonal term. The cost of being in one octagonal uh, cell versus the other octagonal cell could be very different. Okay, and that, those are two examples: spam classification and cancer detection. Uh, in cancer detection, being false positive just leads to a few more tests, but uh, false negative will lead to death. So uh, just want to kind of balance that. Similarly, for spam classification, a regular mail going being flagged as spam is sometimes okay, but uh, 
a regular mail sorry a, uh, sorry a spam being classified as a regular mail is okay but a regular mail getting as uh, becoming a spam is not good because that could be for example the employment contract or something right or something super important okay so and and we briefly discussed you know if depending on what costs are maybe which region you want to be in in the in the rock curve and so that's the threshold that's the, basically if you have a, a classifier for example a is a set of classifiers corresponding to let's say logic regression and you're just changing the threshold then you kind of figure out like the, the right threshold to use maybe over here rather than somewhere else okay that's the fully specified cluster and i think uh, there was a discussion briefly about rock uh, convex hull uh, convex hull is just a uh, idea to kind of um, figure out what the Pareto front is. Convex hull just means, um, convex just means a convex region, corresponds to basically a set or a region, just means that if you take two points in the set, they, if you take a, and draw a line between them in 2D or in, uh, uh, even in higher dimensions, like if you have a line, it doesn't go outside the set. Okay? So things like, uh, you know, like balls or squares, where if you take two points and draw a line, it never gonna go, goes outside. But if you have a wiggly region, then if you take two points somewhere, the line will step out of the the boundary or the ball, uh, sorry, or the or the body of the convex body. So that's what convex hull means, and and we just briefly mentioned that okay, if you want to find a classifier here where both A and C don't seem to be that good, then you can actually just take a if you want to classify with this performance, which is 0 0.2 uh, false positive rate and 0 0.7 uh, true positive rate. And then what you can do is just take a convex combination of like like maybe a this point here and this point here. Okay. So what is the convex combination? You have two classifiers and you're just gonna flip a coin and pick one of the one of their answers. Okay. That's pretty much it. Or you can take one of the answers but weigh them by um, weigh, weigh them by the uh, proportion, but that's kind of hard to do. So at least for binary classification. So basically you take their answer, take their answer, and uh, uh, with some probability you will pick their answer, with some other probability they'll pick, uh, pick the other person's answer. Okay. What is the probability? It depends on where on this example the convex boundary you want to be on like if you are closer to c then clearly you will try to pick c's answer more than a and if you're closer to a then you say uh, a's answer more than c. that's the intuition uh, don't worry about the mechanical details of how to get get that convex um, it's very uh, mechanical uh, okay so yeah so we were just talking about the two types of uh, cost like we have sensitive cost which is not part of the definition of our loss functions. Okay, so because the costs were not part of the loss function, we just train the classifier. Now, because now we care about costs, we are picking up right threshold so that we, uh, you know, this is like deciding threshold so that we are now taking the account that we the cost. Um, whereas uh, you can also take this imbalance into account while training also. Okay, so we are not going to discuss that at the moment. Uh, I think some of the methods that you also know from maybe your projects or the courses is like you can. Or sample the uh, smaller class, or you can have higher higher weights to the loss on the smaller class, and so on, okay. of mispredicting on the smaller class. Okay. Um, but that's during training, and this is like after training, just choosing the threshold. Um, yeah. So as I said last time, we briefly discussed AUC. It's just a, as I said, is a is a summarizing measure. It's an average measure. It's like ROC is looking at every point on the ROC corresponds to a fully defined classifier. AUC is just again summarizing back to uh, the, the set of flex okay. uh, So AUC, so people report accuracy in AUC uh, generally. Um, they are kind of, uh, you know, um, kind of complementary to each other. Um, but if you really care about, but if you really care about deploying a model in practice, you have to choose a, choose a particular threshold. And, and, and that is really, uh, we don't care about the average performance. We care about the exact, you know, that true positive rate or that uh, false positive rate. What is the threshold that we're going to use, and and then you know exactly the numbers, right? Needed the, the there's going to be certain accuracy, there's going to be certain true positive rate, there's going to be certain false positive rate. You know that's more uh, precise. Okay. So as I said, area is just area under the rock curve. Uh, it's just a, a way to say one on average one classifier a collection of classifiers is better than the other. Okay. So B seems to be better than A in this in this example. Uh, same here. And uh, okay, so now, so this is where I want to formally start our today's lecture. We're going to briefly transition from rock curve to a couple of other measures. Okay, so all these measures, by the way, are just functions of those uh, four numbers that we got. You know, we are always in a binary classification place for now, for much of the discussion today. 
um, uh, at least much of the discussion for this section. And so we'll try to create other functions of these four numbers. Okay. And uh, in fact, there will only require one more function of the four numbers. And then point, I'll point, out, point that out in a couple of slides. Okay. Um, so let me recap. Um, uh, I'll recap the functions later. Okay. So here I'm just going to summarize what rockers um, uh, do in binary classification. They help us uh, find a good model uh, and threshold based on the nature of a problem. Nature of the problem really depends on this off diagonal costs and maybe the imbalance in the data. Um, and so point, I mean, basically that, you know, the naive statements like 0.5 is not a good threshold. Uh, maybe it's a good threshold if a class is balanced and you don't care about cost, right? So uh, then it's a good choice. Um, but uh, one key point is the curve itself is complete, is insensitive, insensitive to the change in label distribution. So um, the curve itself is just, uh, you know, whether the number of Positives is 100 versus 100, you know, compared to negatives, which are 1,000, or whether it's uh, 500 versus 500, is the rock curve itself will not change. Okay, so and we'll talk about, um, you know, so so if you want to consider that, you will pick one point on this curve. Okay, the curve itself is kind of uh, irrelevant for you to uh, will not be sensitive to the label distribution, but you can pick a point based on uh, whether positives are greater or negatives, and then if you care about uh, doing well on this, you know, finding those positives. So I think we saw that case in the previous uh, slide, just like cost sensitiveness, class distribution is also something that we considered earlier. Okay. Um, and then uh, we said, okay, uh, AUC can summarize uh, the average performance of one classifier or one classifier set. Uh, and uh, I guess one question you can ask here is can AUC, high AC perform, classifiers perform worse in a specific region? And uh, and they can in the sense of uh, we're going to look at a particular example in the next slide. Okay. Um, so in particular, you know, let's say high AC classifiers. You know, it seems like okay, high AC that means they are at the top uh, left of the rock curve, which is the ideal point, right? Top left is like uh, true positive rate is one and false positive rate is zero. Basically, um, can are are we missing anything else on the picture? And the answer, short answer is yes, because remember the uh, uh, confusion matrix are four numbers, and somehow we reduce it to two numbers, right? The true positive rate and false positive rate are two numbers. So of course uh, there is some loss of information here. Uh, so uh, while you know looking at rock curve and AUC is good, uh, there is one component which is missing, and that's that's what we will discuss to discuss now, which is this you know, uh, this is, which is the notion of precision. Um, so so let's look at that example. So do low false positive rate, okay? Um, yeah, so low false positive rate uh, imply that most of the positive predictions are indeed correct. Okay, so this is the question, uh, and the answer is. Um, so what, what what is the answer at this point? So low false positive rate. So if you remember, I mean, we're gonna look at uh, the picture again so that you know where the false positives are, uh, where the uh, true positives are. So false positives are. Um, yeah, so false positives are like uh, in our in our discussion they are on the um, on the right top right. Okay, so the question is a low false positive rate. Uh, uh, so for false positive rate, if you remember, is nothing but is is on the x-axis of the rock curve. Okay, so low false positive rate just means that the the top right cell divided by the number of negative examples okay. uh, is that, you know, that's low is what it's saying, that that's the first part of the sentence. Okay. Does it uh, imply that most positive uh, predictions are indeed correct? Okay. And the answer uh, is no, right? Because we, we have the um, false negatives. Okay. Um, so actually let's, uh, let's look at the diagram and I come back to the question. Uh, I think it's hard to just handle the, you know, so the answer. So let me actually mention, um, and the answer is kind of partially said by this slide, which is that okay. Now, now let's look at a particular classifier, and from the rock curve, uh, which it's a it's on the rock curve, it's a particular classifier. So it has a particular performance measure in the sense that it's one point on the rock curve, point nine true positive rate, which is like really uh, you know on the y-axis it's very high, and false positive rate of zero point zero one, which is on the very uh, left of this rock curve. So it seems super you know it's not exactly one you know. 0, 1, but it's like very close 
Okay. The question is, is it a good or bad classifier? Okay. Uh, we know where it is located on the rock curve. Okay. Uh, now we want to illustrate uh, the you know the question that we asked. So the low false positive rate. It clearly has a low false positive rate, 0 0.01. Imply that most positive predictions are indeed correct. So okay. So this part requires a little bit of unpacking. Most positive predictions are indeed correct. Okay. It's just asking that are the positive uh, predictions that you're making uh, are, are a good chunk of them correct? So, so for example, I'm you know if you ignore the true label, in the, let's say my data set has thousand uh, points for which I want to make predictions. Maybe I'm making uh, saying that uh, you know maybe uh, two hundred of them are positive. Okay. The question is, um, I'm making two hundred positive predictions. Are most of them correct? It's, it's a little bit of a roundabout question, and and we'll see that in the next few slides, so it'll become more clear. So. Let's say this is the classifier we saw on rock curve. Very good, very good sense of what it does. Now let's talk about uh, a particular. You know, this is a very particular example. So it's looking at uh, what happens when the fraction of positives is like you know this is basically talking about class balance. Okay. So what if the fraction of positives is only 0.5, which is like a nice nice balance, or when the fraction of positives is only 10 percent, 1 percent, or you know less than 1 percent. Okay, 0 0.0 0.1 percent. Okay. So so now we are really going to class imbalance. It is just an illustration to show that the the two numbers or the position in the rock curve is not maybe a complete picture. And let's see that. So what happens? So, okay. Uh, so so for that, I'm now defining a new ratio. Okay, this ratio is not something we've seen before. Uh, this ratio is the true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. So I think let me just come back to yeah. Let me talk about so ignore the text below. Let me just recall this because I think uh, if you don't remember this, then it's going to be very hard to understand which cell we are talking about. True positives, okay, false positives on this on the top left, and false negatives and true negatives. Okay, so rows are the ground truth. Sorry, uh, rows are the prediction, and columns are the ground truth. Okay. Um, so columns just mean, for example, uh, if if it's ten here and twenty here, then the number of positives in the ground truth is thirty. So it's like uh, number of so there there counts here in each cell. So column sum okay of of uh, positives is the number of positives, and column sum of negatives is the number of negatives. Okay. Now if you recall rock curve, rock curve was just looking at two numbers. Okay. The first number was this true positive divided by total number of positives. Okay. Basically true positive divided by TP plus FN, which is basically the number of positives. Okay. This column is a function of this column, which is the y-axis. Similarly, the x-axis. Was false positive rate, okay? So which is just the false positive divided by the number of negatives. Okay. So you have these two numbers which are kind of focused on one column each, okay? And now we are defining. So those are true positive rate and false positive rate. Now we are defining a new ratio which is true positive divided by true positive and false positive. Okay. So it's like a it's a function of uh, two numbers which are uh, horizontal. Okay. So we are focusing on the positive class, whatever we predicted as positive. Among them, some of them are positive and some of them are not positive. Okay. So that's exactly corresponding to the question that we asked. Okay. So among the ones we predicted that were positive, which is this row, how many of them are actually positive? Okay. So that's that's the focus. So now let's come back to this. Uh, that's the ratio here. So among the ones we predicted positive, how many are positive? And so if it's 50-50 uh, class balance, then uh, so you can you can see here, right? So a true positive is going to be uh, 0 0.9. So 0 0.9 is always the true positive rate. Okay. So 0 0.9 times the number of positives. Okay. It's 0 0.5 times m. So m is just think of uh, m is like thousand or something. So m actually cancels cancels out everywhere. So numerator and denominator. So you can ignore m if you want. Okay. So 50% uh, class balance just means 0 0.9 times 0 0.5 is the numerator. And denominator is 0 0.9 times 0 0.5. That's you know the usual. And then the uh, uh, False negative. Okay. This is this part is a false negative, which is 0 0.01 times uh, 0.5. Okay. So that uh, actually this false negative. Oh, sorry, false positive. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, 30 seconds uh, of error. Uh, so we just want the false positive rate, which is 0 0.01, uh, which is exactly here, 0 0.01 times the remaining class. Okay, 0 0.5 times uh, m. So now then you can see that basically when the classes are balanced, then this ratio. Okay, this ratio of out of the number you predicted to be positive, how many are positive? How many are actually positive? 
is a good chunk okay 99% okay so out of the or everything that you are saying positive 99% are actually positive okay which is a good uh, performance but now look at a class imbalanced uh, data okay uh, where only 10% of the uh, data has is positive class okay? for them this ratio of two positive divided by two positive plus false positive for this specific classifier this specific classifier with these numbers you can see what changes right so what changes from the first row to the second row is basically the 0.9 gets multiplied with uh, the the positive class which is only 0.1 times m and then of course this is also 0.1 times m and then the remaining is 0.9 times m the remaining uh, data okay so 0.1 and 0.9 uh, get split okay this way now this uh, split so 0 0.5 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 and here's 0 0.1 0 0.1 and remaining is 0.9 so this ratio leads to a slightly different number, which is now 90%. Okay. So 10% of the time, the ones you said are positive are not positive. Okay. So that are not in reality positive. That's what we're trying to say. And now if you really crank, crank up the imbalance, then you can see that um, although we have really good true positive rate and really good false positive rate, 50% of the time, the things we said are positive are not positive. Okay. And same thing. If you you know even go to the full extreme, you know basically 99% of the time the things you said are positive are not positive. Okay, of course this you can see is a highly imbalanced data set, so maybe you know uh, it's uh, unclear actually what we, you know you know it's really hitting the edge case of performance that we can get. Um, so, but the point is that rock curves are not providing a complete picture clearly because going from four numbers to two numbers is hiding something, is losing something. Okay. The rock curve on the rock curve, we would see a good performance, which is true positive rate and false positive rate. And AUC will be, you know, will be fixed. You know, it, it is, first of all, it's just uh, independent of the specific classifier. Uh, but the ratio of uh, correct uh, positive predictions decreases. Okay, so the ratio of correct positive predictions decreases. Correct predictions are going down. Okay? And for that, uh, therefore, we're going to introduce one additional performance measure. That is called precision which you just saw actually and uh, we just saw the, the measure that we used to uh, show that there's an issue is exactly called precision it's just a true positives divided by true positives plus false positives so it's basically saying out of the things that you predicted positive how many are actually uh, truly positive okay that's how it means and so it's, it's called positive prediction value uh, so so that's basically a function of these two numbers okay so true positive and false positive Rem recall that sorry uh, and remember that Previously, the y-axis of rock curve, it was a function of these two numbers, true positive and false negative. Uh, and so that, that ratio, uh, which is called true positive rate, is also called recall. Okay. So recall is just true positive divided by the total count in, this, in, this, in these two cells of this column. Okay. So that's recall and that's precision. And there's a reason why these names are used. Uh, I guess also you know, overlapping with the information retrieval literature, basically search. So when you search for a query, something comes back. Is this relevant? Is this precise uh, result or something? Basically, that's the link. But we'll kind of add meaning to these uh, two words in the next few slides. Okay. Um, any questions here? Any questions here? Okay. So. But try to remember this, or at least if you have, you know, try to remember where the cells are. Okay, so it's just going to be useful for, you know, uh, remembering. Like if you, so don't get confused. Sometimes some descriptions of uh, this confusion matrix may switch the um, prediction to truth. But for us, predictions are always on the rows, and truth is uh, the columns. Okay? And that way, it's kind of clear. Like precision recall, sorry, um, recall or basically true positive rate is this, this column here. And false false rate is this column here, uh, and then precision is like the, just the ratio between these numbers here. Um, okay, so with that, you know, uh, basically, why I care about precision recall is basically uh, with this informal motivation, okay, informally defined motivation, which is precision is basically trying to say get higher relevancy among uh, the results that are retrieved. Okay, so now I'm using some words, relevance and retrieve. Again, these are words from the information retrieval literature. It's just saying, hey, if you're saying something's a positive, you better, you know, ensure that a good chunk of them are actually positive. You know, that's what we want. Okay? So it's like, uh, you know, 
the, the ones you are saying are positive, if they're not positive, then they're less relevant in some sense. And among retrieved is the ones you're tagging as positive. You as a classifier or you as a system, you're saying, hey, these are the positive ones. You know, those are the ones you're retrieving. You know, better be that they're all kind of uh, relevant. Basically, they're actually positive. Okay, that's what it means. Recall is basically just saying that, uh, remember, recall is true positive, right? So it's basically how many did you, how many of the ground truth did you actually say are, are actually positive? Although there's ground truth, there's maybe 100 positive things in the ground truth. How many of the 100 did you say are positive? Okay, that's like, recall is basically saying, hey, don't forget the ones which are actually positive. Okay, so do not forget the, forget to retrieve the relevant one, relevant one. Okay, so what is this picture here? This picture is just a very, uh, you know, it's just a mental model, like a illustration to kind of show that uh, what's relevant. Okay, so relevant is basically ground truth. Okay, red is ground truth. And what is retrieved? Okay, things that, that you are saying is the um, is the positive class. Okay, let's really focus on positive class. You know, they may be different. Okay, that's all this illustration is trying to say. Okay, so there is a gap between what is supposed to be positive and what uh, you are saying is positive. Okay, so that gaps are basically you know things outside this intersection. The thing inside the intersection is exactly hey, in ground truth is positive and you said it's positive. So that's the um, and and here for simplicity ease of understanding, I think okay, relevant let's say are actually actual spam, the ground truth spam, and then retrieve as the ones you're saying are, are spam. Okay? If you want to use an example, so let's actually look at uh, a few variations that things that people use to uh, at least formally or at least professionally say you know what's the quality of a model. So in addition to confusion matrix, in addition to true false rate, false false rate. You can report precision recall numbers. Okay, we will see that those numbers and those numbers are just we saw they're just ratios. But uh, you can say a model has some property and some, some other property. Okay, which is hey the model has high precision but low recall. Okay, that's one statement you can make. So high precision recall is low recall is basically you know let's say your model is uh, is a, is very selective. So it's like only you know very few examples saying it's possible. Then you know most likely whatever it's saying is positive may actually be you know may may actually be realistically positive. So it just just means that the blue set that I showed in the previous slide is condensed down into a smaller set and just happens to be inside the uh, ground truth. Okay? So which means that you're doing really high precision in the sense that remember precision is the all of the things that you said are positive. How many are positive? The things that I said are positive are really small. I mean, really few in number and really, you know, like maybe I, I said three of them are positive. It's very obvious that maybe I can get all of them right in the sense that they happen to be positive as well. Okay, So here it's high precision in terms of precision metric. Precision could be very high, like one or something. But then recall is terrible, right? So all, recall is about true positive rate. So it's basically all the things that are positive, all the things that are positive, which is this whole set, you only said only like few points are positive, few of the observations are positive. The recall is very bad, right? Is that is that clear? Yeah. So and similarly, you can have these other variations. So you can have low precision but low recall as well. This is like a really bad situation where whatever you're saying is not ever positive. Like the things that you're saying are positive or not positive. <laughs> In fact, not at all positive. And uh, you know the set is um, you know uh, and you're not retrieved anything related to the things that are actually positive. So it's like completely off. Uh, you know, and this is something you should. Uh, you can you can check okay this 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 are actually useful where uh, you wanna um, uh, you know where you care about the quality of the uh, performance of the model not across not across both the classes you really care about positives are being captured well or not that's what we are discussing here okay? and here is a another mode where uh, you have low precision but high recall okay high recall why because what are we predicting is uh, positive. Now it has a good overlap with the red set, okay, really pretty, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent overlap. But then you have low precision because you are saying many other things are positive which are not positive, okay, they are outside the red set. And then the last version is high precision and high recall, where you're really, uh, if you think of the confusion matrix, you have high high numbers on the diagonal and low low numbers, you know, very low or kind of non-zero, you know, almost zero numbers on the off diagonal. Okay? That means you're pretty much you know, whatever you're saying is positive is mostly positive, and maybe there are some which are you're saying is positive and not positive. That's okay. And similarly, you're retrieving or you know, all of the ground truth 
whatever number of positives, most of them you have classified as positive. Okay. Um, yeah. Any questions about this? Um, okay. So what we are just so since we discussed, you know, there's a, there's one extra number that we produce precision. Recall was already there, which is the y-axis of your or rock curve. Now we can talk about again a very similar curve to uh, rock curve called precision recall curve. Okay. Uh, it's just a it has it doesn't have all the nice uh, it has a different, uh, I guess, it can give you complementary information to the rock curve. Okay. So, precision recall curve is basically uh, x axis is uh, recall and y axis is precision. So, what you want is a high precision, high recall. So, basically, a point which is in the top right, okay, which is different from rock curve where the point was on the top left. Okay. So, you want high precision and high recall. Um, so, imagine on the, on the, think of, you know, let's think of a dumb model which can achieve high recall. What would be a dumb model which achieves recall of one? What do you think? Yeah, so remember recall is uh, basically true positives divided by um, total number of positives. So if you want to have high recall, so everything that's positive, you want to say positive. And as you said, uh, you know, that I can do that if I want to be dumb. I can say hey, everything is positive. That's exactly what you said. So which means that I don't care about the negative, negative side. They also am saying is positive. So therefore, at least on the things which are positive, I am actually covering them fully okay, in, in terms of size. But then uh, your precision, you know, is going to be whatever is the fraction of uh, your precision is going to be uh, true positive divided by basically the you're saying everything is positive, which means that it's basically denominator is the full data set, and the numerator is the the ones which are actually positive. So which is exactly the class class proportion. Okay. So if you really think of a dumb model, it's it's on precision recall curve or precision recall space. It's going to be a point like this. Okay. Uh, it's like uh, it's going to have low precision but very high recall. Okay. Uh, and then you can go the other extreme where uh, you have very high precision. But extremely low recall. So where you ensure that true positives divided by, um, uh, so you basically ensure that there are no false positives. Okay. So there's nothing on the uh, top left, top, top right of the confusion matrix. So, um, so that's those are two extremes, and then you can have you know have a trade-off between precision and recall, just like you saw a trade-off between uh, true positive rate and false positive rate. In the rock curve, and and so you can uh, you know chart it out, and then maybe you can prefer some model versus some classifier versus the other based on whether you want high precision or high recall. Okay, so there is a trade-off between both. And of course, the ideal situation is when you have a classifier which does exactly you know so it will have a confusion matrix. Where the diagonals are all zero, the two both the false positives and uh, false negatives are zero, and so I got the true positives correctly. I got the uh, false negatives correctly. That means that I'll be the ideal point here. I'll have high precision because there's no so the false positives are zero, and high recall uh, because uh, if you look at the first um, uh, column uh, again, there's a zero uh, in the bottom left. So that's the ideal class. Ideal class basically is to do perfect classification, which uh, you know it's, it's hard to do. I mean, maybe you're forfeiting. I mean, it may not hard to do, but if you're evaluating on training data, you may be doing forfeiting. Okay, so let's briefly discuss uh, PR curves, uh, which are the precision recall curves, and uh, so very similar uh, to rock curve construction. We basically think in terms of hey, to construct uh, the precision recall curve, we can. Uh, Choose threshold. So we have a model which produces scores. Okay, so we're not changing that. That's fixed. Now every time we choose a different threshold, uh, we get a different uh, confusion matrix basically, and therefore we get different precision values and different recall values. And then you can just plot them in the in the 2D space, right? And so each threshold basically yields a different point in the PR, PR space. Uh, so you can draw very similar to the rock curve interpretation. So you can sort your uh, you know validation data. Let's say there are 10 points here. You can sort them based on scores, and then you can navigate, uh, you know, from from the top. Like you can compute recall, you can compute precision. If if uh, 
um, yeah, you can compute recall encryption at this point, and then you can keep computing uh, one below the other. So let me, uh, yeah. So basically, you start with the high score, and you're basically saying head or shoulders 0.9 or above. Then recall is basically how many did you say is 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 the true positive? True positive is because there's only one which is greater than 0.9 out of the six which are positive. Then recall is um, one out of six. And similarly, precision is are the ones that are positive, how many did you say positive, which is one out of one, and so precision is one. So you can imagine how to compute this, right? So it's not it's not complicated. Um, given thresholds, and so you will see a curve like this. Okay, this doesn't seem um, you know as nice as uh, the rock curve, at least the construction, but uh, you know, which leads to the point, which is that uh, since it's in, it has a little bit of a wiggly nature, you know, for example, here it's, it's Suppression so and recall are kind of low here, but here uh, recall is high and precision is high, and here uh, you know recall is low but uh, precision is high. So there's a little bit of a you know zigzag nature going on here, which makes it a hard to compare two different models. So the two different models will have zigzag curve, then it's a little bit hard to eyeball and say which one is better. But we, as we already said, our curves which are kind of closer to the top right. Precision of one, we call it one, basically, are, are, are better. Okay. And so if you have to kind of, if you have kind of narrowed down like a couple of models or a couple of model configurations, then you can tie break based on the measures that we saw before, like maybe AUC or maybe uh, how they perform in the rock curve, for example. So you can use both of them to isolate which model. Okay, so yeah. And, and there's a different way to also like, not just looking at the, uh, like visually do this by uh, trying to pick a point on the top right in the in that precision recall region. But what people typically report is um, they will fix the recall at some value and then compute precision. Okay, so it's just basically chopping up. If you have two models, for example, if you have two models, uh, then they'll have two curves like this. You can just say, hey, for each for a recall of forty percent, uh, what are the what is the average precision? What is the what's the what's the average precision for recall of eighty percent? So on. It's just a tab table version of this, and then you can figure out um, uh, which which one to. You can probably like uh, look at it and prefer the ones which are high precision or high recall. Okay. Okay. So yeah, pick the best one uh, visually or by AUC. And so there's uh, so the question arises. Okay. So why do I have to look at a graph, or why do I have to look at two columns of numbers to uh, kind of pick the model. Is there any other further further reduction from two numbers less than one number? Okay, and there is. Uh, it's called uh, F measure. Okay, uh, it's a it's a function of precision and recall. So once you compute precision and recall numbers, then F measure is just a some some summaries some uh, you know function of these two deterministic function of these two. In particular, F measure is just a what is called a harmonic mean of uh, recall and precision. So harmonic mean uh, for two numbers looks like this. Uh, it's like uh, very similar to arithmetic mean or geometric mean uh, ideas. So it's basically two divided by one by recall plus one of precision. Okay. So just summarizing two numbers into one number. Uh, so uh, if you if you imagine like recall is one and precision is one, so F measure is going to be one. Okay. So two divided by one plus one is one. Okay. Now if you think of recall and precision, let's say 0.5 each, then uh, F measure is going to be let's say 0.5. Because two divided by two plus two is basically four, and so you have 0.5 precision. So what I'm saying is, if you have lower precision recall values, then F measure is going to be lower. If precision recall values are really high, then F measure is going to be high. Um, and you have a very, you know, a related measure called E measure, or uh, kind of rarer, where you can say, hey, I'm going to use these two to define one number. What if I prefer uh, one uh, precision more than recall, or if I care about more, care more about precision, sorry, care more about recall than precision. Okay, just a little bit of, hey, if I care a little bit more about one of the columns than the other, then how do I average? I can take, a, I can put an extra, uh, you know, weight on it. Okay, so maybe I care recall more, then I can I, I can choose this beta square. You know why? You know don't worry about square here, but uh, some coefficient here which is uh, which is high. Okay, so if, if the coefficient is high. That means that if, if uh, recall is low, then heavily penalizes the, the E value. 
if the recoil is high then it's then it's nice okay uh, similarly if, if beta is low then it kind of is preferring uh, models with high precision okay just a formalized thing for you to summarize things into one number so that one number can kind of quantify uh, which model you prefer and which one, which you don't um yeah so i think i'll i'll skip this description is another measure since we defined a uh, precision recall there's something called uh, mean average precision or average precision which is just a uh, just asking hey what is the average precision on my uh, when i retrieve my positive example okay so you you have the table sorted according to the scores that you're producing your model is producing you just look at what are the precision values that i saw uh, while uh, you know when i predicted positive okay so that's like uh, 1 plus 2 by 2 plus 3 by 4 plus 4 by 6 so it's, it's just an average position. it's just an average of the precision number that i computed it's also something that people report uh, in particular not just average position something called mean average position which is just say uh, if you have multiple faults for example you have multiple such uh, tables and so you'll have multiple average position values you just average them okay um yeah, so let me just uh, wrap, up, wrap this part up and so that we can talk about, uh, you know, we can do a review of supervised learning and, and more generate, generative models. Um, so both, you know, so far we've been only talking about binary classification and, and you, as, as somebody pointed out, for multi-class classification, beyond accuracy and looking at confusion matrices, you know, things are a little bit, you know, more heuristic there. I mean, you can define, it's not heuristic and it's not hard, it's not hard but you define based on your uh, preference of what, what you want to look at, what type of measures you want to look at. Okay. Um, both uh, assist in, uh, uh, you know, both help in assessing, model assessing, the performance of uh, uh, your classifiers at various levels of confidence. Uh, you can summarize um, actually both uh, log curve and PR, PR curves using area under the curve, uh, but we're only talking about area under the curve for rock curve so far. Uh, rock curves are in, in sensitive changes in label distribution and uh, this is one of the reasons why you know the uh, precision was off uh, for highly imbalanced data sets okay uh, they can help you identify you know good threshold when cost of being false positive is very different from cost of being false negative okay so if it's different they help you really understand what's the right choice to make to completely define a classifier and uh, pr curves focus mostly on one of the classes like we like positive class it's basically more you know ties it and uh, makes it closer to how information retrieval folks think about things. So uh, they help you uh, kind of retrieve uh, retrieve um, uh, the right examples. Okay, so precision is really about out of the uh, positive that you predicted, how many were actually positive. So it's it's a new measure, and that's that's what helps you uh, focus on positive class, of course, but is more useful for. Uh, situations where you don't really care about negative examples. So basically, for example, think of a marketing setting where you care about people who will uh, churn or people who will respond to your coupon or something like that. You don't care about people who don't, although that, that class exists and maybe you build a classifier on, on people who churn and people who don't or people who respond to coupons and people who don't. Uh, so really, if you want to focus on positive class, one of the classes uh, quite a bit, and PR curves may be more, a little bit more helpful. And, and there's of course uh, there has to be class imbalance uh, as well. Yeah. So uh, so let me just come back and uh, very briefly uh, before I get into uh, supervised learning review uh, or at least an overview, uh, I want to briefly touch about uh, talk about hypothesis testing. Okay. Uh, we saw briefly a hypothesis test uh, earlier in the last lecture when we talked about. Uh, rejecting the null that the uh, true error rate is less than 10% when I observed something uh, like very good performance on the validation data. Okay, we did that. We did some sort of hypothesis testing to quantify how our model performs in reality. Or uh, when we build confidence intervals, confidence intervals are very closely related to hypothesis testing. Okay. Um, so, uh, ideally, if you want to do model assessment, okay, so yes, yeah, assessment is like give me a score for two classifier or something like that, uh, then you also want to say that, you know, you don't want to just report two numbers, but you want to say that they are actually, one is actually statistically different from the other. Okay. So in the sense that one has quantifiably different performance than the other. Okay. So if like two of them have, you know, 86% uh, accuracy and 82% accuracy. Is that really a big difference or not? Okay. That's the, that's the question. Um, 
and it's hard to do that. Uh, we'll see partial answer in the next few slides uh, to to kind of uh, show you at least a couple of tools if you you know which you could potentially use. Um, one of them, uh, the tool, in fact, will kind of restrict our attention to is called t-test. Okay. Uh, to t-test, t -test, I guess the t part just corresponds to what is called a t-statistic. Okay. It's just a function of data. Uh, just think of it that way. Uh, remember, statistics are just functions of data, and we talked about sufficient statistics and stuff like that before. So, t test, t, t test is just about trying to test uh, uh, a hypothesis about mean, okay, a, a means of a mean of a distribution. Okay. So, in particular, uh, two means. Okay. So, so basically, uh, whether two means, one could be from a second sample or one could be a reference number. Basically, whether the mean that you computed is very different from the reference or, or the second sample, uh, and so uh, you know it makes sense when the uh, test statistic itself follows normal distribution. So, okay. so single sample t-test is just about comparing uh, some estimate that you got sample mean uh, to the population mean or some reference number. Okay, so that's a that's one type of t-test. Uh, the the type, type of t-test that we'll be interested, for example, to do model assessment between two models uh, is, uh, for example, unpaired t-test or a paired t-test. Okay. Unpaired t-test just means you know two two models, two different performance scores, and maybe two different validation data sets, and then I just want to say, hey, one number is better than the other or not. Okay. I want to reject the null that they are they are kind of the same. Okay. Uh, unpaired t-test is uh, uh, when you have two dependent sets of measures. Okay, sorry, when you have uh, yeah, two dependent sets of measures. For example, it makes sense for within subjects. So, for example, um, before uh, some change of treatment and after some change of treatment for the same person, how how did they how did they do? Okay, uh, on some metric. And so uh, in that case, you can use paired data. Okay. So let's actually focus on uh, uh, actually here's a sum summary. So hypothesis test. If you are if you're doing a uh, single sample t test. Uh, you just uh, uh, one set of examples, okay, one one data set, uh, and then you're comparing. You know, you have a you're looking at a distribution of the mean uh, follows the normal. And if you have a pair t-test, you know the comparison is always the same. Distribution of mean uh, follows normal. Sorry, distribution of the mean differences follows normal, and distribution of mean differences follows normal. But paired versus unpaired, the only difference is uh, both have two data sets, where in paired case. You have the same subject being uh, same, I guess, subject as in data point, uh, exposed to one or exposed to the other. And here in the unpaired situation, they are like potentially two different data. So let's actually look at the unpaired one uh, for simplicity. Uh, so here's uh, an example. Of it. So what, how does it? How does this data thing can be used? How can the data be used to say something more beyond reporting uh, assessment numbers? You know, for two models. Uh, for that, you need to do a, a little bit more preparation. So if you you need to have two data sets, D1 and D2, which itself, we, so we're basically kind of building on the holdout validation idea. So we're going to use D train one and D val one, D train two and D val two. So we're going to use D train one um, to train, uh, you know, let's say model one or algorithm one, and D train two to train a model two or algorithm two. Then I'm going to say, hey, what is the performance of algorithm one on D val one? And uh, how is the performance of, uh, I guess, algorithm two or basically has had two on D value two. So it's really, we we had an original set we really chopped up into several several pieces, and because we made an assumption which is IID assumption, uh, you know, it kind of makes it easy for us to uh, compute these uh, summarizing numbers, okay, and and then do a hypothesis test, okay. Which, what is the hypothesis that the, you know, we want to kind of the null hypothesis is that the, these two errors are the same. Okay. The error performance, the true error performance of uh, model one and true error performance of model two is the same. And then, uh, um, yeah, so error performance is the same. And then we can, you know, we, we saw this Bernoulli uh, assumption about errors uh, last time, I, I think uh, two lectures ago. And then, if you remember Bernoulli, too, we made a normal approximation. And if you do the normal approximation, basically we can use t-test. Okay. The unpaired t-test, in particular. So basically, this is the simplest one where you have two numbers, um, and uh, both had you know gener were generated from two data sets where the data sets uh, x-y observations are not related to each other. Okay. 
Okay, so D val one and D val two are kind of not related to each other, and uh, I mean other than being drawn from the same distribution. And then you have two uh, pair, two sets of data uh, from which you got two summarizing stats, uh, error, this error and this error. So based on that, the difference between them will give you the t statistic, and uh, you can you can define whether the, based on the t statistic whether to reject the null or not reject the null. The null being that the true performance is the same okay, between the two clusters. So if you can reject the null, that's great. You can say, hey. Not only do I have assessment of these two models, but also I can uh, quantify that one is strictly better than the other, okay, um, with a high confidence. So, uh, I think uh, yeah. Let me uh, briefly mention k fold because. Although these tests uh, are good, but they, as we saw in the previous slide, you need D1, D2, D, you know, D train, D val, and so on, uh, which is kind of hard to, you know, do in the sense that it's very not, it's not an efficient use of data. So ideally, you wanna use as much data as possible to learn a generalizable classifier or generalizable model. And so, k for classification fits the bill. You know, it lets you uh, kind of proxy the true performance, just like uh, holdout validation, as well as the previous slide. It gives you a sense of what the performance will be in in the in the reality right? in in the population, right? Uh, but uh, the con uh, con of k-fold is that we it's much more complex to compare complex it's much more complex than comparing just to hypothesis on a data set, uh, which is what uh, which is what we kind of relied on when we talked about holdout validation as well as uh, this um, previous slide. Um, uh, so it's much more complex than uh, the case with the two, two, two training sets we saw earlier because uh, the, in the previous slide they were independent of each other. The two training sets were independent of each other, whereas for us uh, each model is kind of dependent on uh, they kind of share the common data, right? So for example, model one and model two uh, in the k-fold loop uh, causation loop, like one can use uh, fold one, two, three, four. The other one can use uh, fold two, three, four, and let's say five. Okay. Which means that there's a data set that was common for both models, and so they are not kind of independent anymore. Okay. So, uh, um, so that makes the analysis uh, or giving these sets of doing these sets of tests hard. Okay. So, so careful correlation has those limitations in practice, but um, people have you know some uh, more complex. Methodology to deal with uh, being able to say confidence intervals or doing the doing testing and so on, but a little bit more involved. Let me uh, kind of skip these uh, last few slides. Uh, any questions about this? Okay. Let's see. Let's see if there's a question on chat. Okay, there's a question um, which is can we use F measure if you're unable to choose between recall and position? Yeah, I mean, unable to choose between position and recall? Yeah, because um, the answer is kind of yes, but it's basically you're not, you're avoiding the problem of choosing between position and recall by just saying, hey, I'm going to weigh them equally via this harmonic mean. Okay, so you are just saying that uh, I'm just going to have a particular way in which I'm going to, uh, you know, Balance between position and recall. So I mean, and so that's what F measure does. So if you wanna don't wanna talk about how you balance it, but there's a particular way that being suggested in the literature, then you can use F measure. Yeah. Um, so let me. Okay, so the question is uh, model assessment and selection. We've been mostly discussing about supervised learning models and particular classification, in particular binary classification. Uh, can we do very similar, not similar, but do we have a good set of tools to do assessment for unsupervised uh, learning approaches? Right, that's the question. 
the short answer is uh, uh, no. The short answer is no. I mean, if you, it depends on the length of the answer, but the short answer is no. Uh, that's because the unsupervised learning, there is no good uh, quantitative measure of success. Okay. Uh, supervised signals provide quantitative measures of success, success easily for supervised learning. Clearly, you can have a, like you can, your manager can hold out data and then just really, you can give them whatever model you, you, you think is good. And they can literally just say, hey, the model prediction is this, and you know, my hold out, held out data, whatever test data, the actual, actual supervisor signal says this, so your model is not good. So there's a there's very objective measure. Whereas with unsupervised learning, you can always go, you know, come up with some uh, proxy measures, you know, of quality of, of your unsupervised learning approach. Um, but there is no um, uh, there is no ground truth, right? Unless you go back and do some annotation, and then that will provide a way to uh, differentiate between an approach one versus approach two. But we have not seen unsupervised learning so far. Uh, we'll see some some unsupervised learning techniques uh, once we pass the generative lens. Okay, um, we'll we'll look at PCA and, and uh, clustering and things like that. Yeah. I mean, as again, as I said, the objective in this course is not to cover that. I think in 572, for example, you look at like one model, two models a day, or something. Uh, here, it's really understand like the nuances and and learn, and pick up. Uh, some ways to discuss uh, these, uh, these, you know, these these, these technical concepts. Uh, pick up these technical concepts and, and communicate them effectively with your team members or other stakeholders. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch topic. I'm thinking maybe now is a good time to uh, take a short break. Uh, so let's resume at 4:22. Uh, okay, um, I gave an early break because it's a slightly switching topic. So, uh, but we've done much of the hard work, you know, really getting into the details of knowledge segregation, exponential family, linear regression, uh, you know, model assessment, model selection, uh, and so on. So from here on, it's going, mostly going to be fill in those gaps, recap, and, and see some extra ideas. Okay, so do that. But you know, the reason why we are doing it is to kind of motivate us towards generative generative models. Okay? So um, have people already seen the idea of generative models before? In some version, maybe in 572, you might have come across. Oh no, not yet. Okay, so generative models are just a name for models which uh, kind of model the joint distribution between input and output. Uh, whereas uh, many models that we've seen before, like the linear regression model or the loss regression model, they are not modeling the joint distribution between input and output. Okay? They are only modeling the, if at all they do, they model the conditional distribution of output given input. Okay, so that's and a short answer for what generative models are. Generative models focus on the joint distribution. Whereas discriminative models, which is the other class, they focus on the conditional probability of output given input. Okay. But you know that's a short answer. So let's really spend some time on recapping what we've done uh, with respect to the models we have seen uh, so far, and then motivate uh, us towards generative models. Okay. So the outline for this is not the outline for today. I mean, in fact, much of it we'll cover uh, in the next uh, lecture as well. Uh, but basically, we'll kind of quickly recap supervised learning and train cla training classifiers because what we've done um, so far, actually, if you swap out instead of logic regression, if you swap it out with uh, XD boost, not XD boost, sorry, brain boosting machines or uh, random forest or any other you know classifier that you think uh, you know, it's basically going to be a similar discussion. Okay? So in, instead of spending time on one more model class and, and dealing with it, in, in fact, we kind of jumped over um, support vector machines. It's going to be very similar treatment. So it's, uh, you know, at some point in time, you kind of get bored, right? So it's, very similar treatment, uh, but the concerns, you know, still remain the same. Okay, so the type of concerns we raised in model assessment, model selection, 
or uh, understanding the outputs or issues uh, with respect to model choices or issues with algorithms uh, like gradient descent. Sometimes it works, sometimes you know it may not work depending on how messy your problem is. So those all concerns kind of are general concerns, okay? And so you should kind of keep them in the back of your mind as you pick up a different model for your application and so on. But um, so today we'll kind of briefly just look at the first two uh, points and uh, kind of continue uh, on that uh, on that idea next class and, and so on. Okay. Uh, but the uh, some of them are reviews actually, uh, but, but the uh, but something like Gaussian discriminant analysis, uh, Neve's and hidden Markov models they are just models. Um, in fact, the last one is related to time series, but they are models which have uh, uh, in which kind of are generative in nature. And then let me, uh, uh, before getting into generative models, let's talk about a quick recap on the, you know, the, uh, the models that we've seen so far, which all are discriminative. So let's re recap what uh, is the setting. You know, there's a, so this, there's some assumptions being made, by the way. So when you look at some statements here, they're being presented as facts, but they're, they're not facts. Okay. So everything is an assumption or can be verified by data. Or it's a domain knowledge. Domain knowledge generally as an assumption, or could be a fact for that domain. Right? Um, so, th so we are assuming that there exists a unknown but fixed joint distribution between x and y. Okay. So first of all, why should it be fixed? You know, data can change. Okay? So from one uh, one uh, month of sales to another month of sales, people change, people's behaviors change, competitors change. So of course, we don't expect the same performance. I mean, it makes sense for a stock market as well, right? But here we are assuming fixed unknown joint distribution between X and Y. And, uh, you know, as I think it says here as a caveat that, yeah, you know, for some harder problems, you cannot keep the distribution fixed. Uh, and there are ways to get around this issue of distribution shift, okay? Uh, the names like covariate shift or uh, distribution, I mean, distribution changing is an issue, okay, in general in data science. Next uh, is we're given a training data set, uh, XMII, from this joint distribution, uh, some M in number, okay? And we're going to assume that uh, the data set X and Y I have nothing to do with X, J, Y, J for any other uh, observation. So basically, we're assuming independent and identically distributed. Okay. Now, this is an assumption. Okay. This uh, uh, independence and then uh, being identically distributed is an assumption. For example, uh, think of it this way, right? So you're making measurements on uh, a weekend versus making measurements on weekday of, let's say, a website visitor. They are probably, you know, they are probably not identically distributed because weekend visitors may be different from weekday visitors. Okay, so that's uh, there's an issue with identical distribution. There's also an issue with independence. Okay, if you're measuring the same perform same person's activities on your website, okay, maybe maybe that person is, uh, you know, logged into your, let's say you're doing e-commerce and a person logged into your, onto, your, onto your website, and you're and you're making some measurements related to what they're doing. You know, then observations, you know, maybe they're generating feature vectors, but they're all correlated because they are the same person and that could be different from another person. If it's a completely different person, then you can think of independence, but the same person generating data, maybe there is some, you know, relation between them. You will not be able to see that, but we're going to make that assumption, IID. And then we also have, you know, it's actually a really good case. We have a loss function. The loss function, so we have a function itself. Okay, which is kind of a challenging situation to be in. Uh, sorry, it's kind of a very good situation to be in. Uh, so, this, so we have access to this function and we decided to generally, right? We chose high training error or misclassification loss or some other like a square loss or something. That's a function which, you know, it's like a full description function, which is different from uh, getting a number, right? So it's saying, hey, uh, for yi, whatever you predict, I can tell you what the loss is, okay? Uh, so, so and that's the point here being made is that it's so special that it can teach us the loss for an arbitrary pair of uh, of inputs. Okay. So I can tell you if the ground truth is something, and if you predict something else, I can tell you what the loss is. And that something else can be so think of a five class classification. The ground truth could be class one, but I can tell you what the loss is going to be if it if you predict class one, when you predict class two, when you predict class three, when you can predict class four, and so on. So that's a lot of information defined by this function. But um, in some harder problems, okay, last line here, in some harder problems, you only know the loss for uh, the class that you predicted. Okay, so think of a situation where you have a, you have a feature vector on which you predicted a class, and then, and then somebody expert comes and says, 
hey, that's not the right class. Think of that. So that situation where they're saying, hey, it's not the right class. Same five class application. You don't know what the right class is. So you need four more tries to say, hey, you, you figure out like the right class should be maybe class four. Right? So that's very different situation than somebody giving a function. Because once they give a function, then you can say, if I try class, if I try class one, I know some loss. If I try class two, I know some loss. So there's no further like uh, uh, interaction needed. Whereas in harder problems, you predict the class, you only know whether that whether you correct or wrong. Uh, you know, and you don't know what the right class is okay, immediately. Maybe you try a few times and then you know what the correct class. So why do I, why am I emphasizing the last point? Is because in much of real world, okay, these uh, classes, these predictions that you're making, typically can also be you know maybe are highly related to actions that you take, like a buy action in stock market or. Uh, uh, or like inventory decision, like hey, let's uh, set a, set some price ten dollars for our inventory today, and uh, maybe nine dollars tomorrow or something like that. So making a decision, and uh, that may not be the right price, okay? and and you don't know what the right right price could be. So you 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 predict a class, or you predict a price. You know, it's kind of somewhat related to each other. And then you only know the performance of what you predicted. You know, maybe it's a bad price, or maybe it's a bad choice you made, like a buy, uh, buying some stuff. But you don't know what would have happened uh, if you did something else. And you said some other. Price. For stock, you know, it's a slightly contrived situation because you buying or selling has no impact on the market. But imagine if you're a if you're Vanguard or whatever BlackRock, and you bought something. Okay, so that's going to cha change the market. But you wouldn't know what would have happened if you did something else. So. So that, those are like what I'm saying is harder problem. Anyway, so just wanted to use that slide to say there are a lot of caveats for supervised learning, uh, um, um, you know, setup. Um, two examples of supervised learning: uh, the typical examples, regression and classification. Uh, we'll focus on classification for the rest of the review, basically. So uh, let's look at classifiers. Uh, from two points of view. Okay, so one point of view is from loss function, which we'll do in a couple of slides. The first point of view is going to be from the perspective of decision boundaries. Okay? Remember, classifiers, decision boundaries we have been thinking about since since lecture one. So there are classifiers which really focus on just trying to get to the decision boundary directly. Okay? They don't. Uh, the decision boundary is like the most important thing. Um, and, uh, and and two examples of that. This type of classifiers are uh, decision trees and uh, support vector machines. Okay. I'll, I'll briefly mention what support vector machines are in a second. Um, so what are, we, what are we trying to do? So in general, for supervised learning, we are certainly trying to get the best hypothesis to minimize some loss function. And generally, something like this. Okay. So h hat is the argument, the one that minimizes over the collection of functions. Okay. H in uh, script h is just a over over all linear functions or all uh, you know whatever class of uh, classifiers. Get the best classifier that minimizes some training loss. Okay, that's what we want to do in terms of uh, optimization. Um, and uh, decision trees are basically, you know, doing that, right? So the loss function is basically training error or whatever misclassification error, or uh, some function of information gain or some other, you know, uh, measures that you have seen while doing node splits, right? Um, and your hypothesis class, so uh, this collection of collection of uh, hypothesis uh, script edge, uh is basically access parallel boundary in the sense that you basically split on one of these features. Let's just, let's think of numeric situation. Then you say, hey, the feature value is less than something, greater than something. Okay, that's a split, which is parallel to other axes, basically. Right? It's perpendicular to the axis that you split, but parallel to the other axis. Right? Um, but basically, this collection, uh, so from here, you're get, basically getting addition boundary, which is like uh kind of jagged right so left right you know if in two dimensions you can see either it goes decision boundary goes left or right or it goes up and down or in higher dimensions it's gonna just be parallel to axis okay um and minor point here is that these decision boundaries are built to discriminate uh you know are really built to discriminate between positive and negative samples uh deciding which uh side is positive which uh, side is negative is kind of not uh you know is not super important Okay. Uh, basically, the discrimination itself is, is what is important in the sense that you can flip the positive, negative, negative, positive, and you'll get the same answer uh, unless you change the loss function or something like that. So, unless you do special treatment, 
it's not exactly the absolute value of which one is positive which one is negative you know it's just that you just need to know which is what is different like one is different than the other um so here is a second uh, classifier which we not talked about uh, in this uh, lecture much but uh, this slide serves as an introduction to that uh, which also focuses on decision boundary so these are two classifiers where there is of course when you, you either you focus on decision boundary or a loss function at the end of the day there has to be some loss function you are maximizing or minimum, sorry minimizing uh, but let's look at this particular uh, model whose central central focus is really on addition boundary so it's uh, the support vector machine is a linear model at least the version that i'm introducing here um which min, which uh, which optimizes a what is a constraint optimization problem okay. so a constraint optimization problem is something that we have not seen in the class so far okay. uh, so it's an optimization problem in the sense that it has its own loss function okay and will relate it to general loss function a typical loss function we've seen in a second so it has a very weird uh, you know objective function i think uh, at least uh, if you think of the motivation there's some objective function it, it is trying to learn uh, w and b just think of w as theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 and b as like theta naught okay, like the intercept so it's learning uh, so we are trying to find w and b such that you know some two norm square of w is small and some uh, you know constant c is like let's say 10 times some other sum of numbers is small okay so the sum of c ci okay this greek letter ci is just some stand in variable so some bunch of these numbers are small okay and where is the data entering okay the data is entering in these what are called constraints okay and that's why it's a constraint optimization problem uh first of all you want uh, you know so we are trying to minimize our w and b um actually we should also add ci here uh, which is which is also minimization variable okay. uh so just think of w b and ci and we just want to ensure that okay fx w and b and ci such that constraints are met and uh, this objective function is as small as possible so that's what we want to do so just contrast it with grain descent stuff that we are doing where we didn't have constraints uh, or we had like very generous constraints like any positive number any you know real number or something and we just wanted to minimize the uh, loss function as uh, so a minimize objective right here there is some objective function of w and c and there's no b here in objective Uh, but you know we want to minimize over those w b and c such that um, objective function is objective is as low as possible as well as constraints are met okay and in the constraints like one set of constraints are just hey keep the c's positive okay so only c's can only be as low as zero second thing is uh, i want a you know particular expression like this which is uh, y i times w transpose x i plus b the so w transpose x i plus b looks like our hypothesis function right from uh, our uh linear linear case right so a uh, hypothesis uh, function evaluation times yi to be greater than or equal to 1 minus ci okay so it's a particular expression but uh, uh what i want to mention is that first of all these y okay we are only focusing on binary classification recall these y are going to be values uh, takes values minus 1 and 1 okay just for this particular formulation just if you, in case you had 0 and 1 Just change zero to minus one, one to uh, one as is. Okay, just so just so this formulation makes sense. Okay. So in that sense, what what we are trying to do with this constraint is that uh, when y i, so when you are when you are, um, so what we are trying to do is get a decision boundary in a binary classification setting. Okay. So and in particular, we are focusing on getting a linear decision boundary. Okay. And what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to see, hey, what is W transpose x i plus b? Okay. um and if if this number okay then whatever this evaluates to is a number is that if that number is positive then if the label is also positive okay then we are good okay then it's going to be greater than something like 1 minus ci okay but uh if this number is negative what w transpose xi plus b is negative then it better be that y is also negative such that their product is positive and so it's still greater than 1 minus ci So just think of one minus c i as some sort of you know some small positive number, if you want, okay, or or one for example. You just want you know if a label is positive, it better be that this uh, w transpose x plus b is also positive, so that you know positive positive is like positive enough. And if y i is negative, just ensure that w transpose x plus b is also negative, such that the the product is also you know kind of false. Okay, that's what this constraint is informally like uh, I want to motivate it that way. Any questions here? 
So it turns out this this actually gives us what does it give at the end of the day? It's going to give us a W and D solution, right? It, and we can actually interpret that as learning a model and a log function. And we're going to see that in a second. So so people motivated this expression of hey, why this particular objective and why this constraint in a certain way, some geometric way. Uh, there are also multiple interpretations, but there are some ways people motivated uh, this particular this particular objective and constraint. But they can be mapped back to what we know before. Like uh, we can map it back to a loss function, and and talk about what is the function hypothesis class uh, that we are optimizing over, uh, and and then talk about the decision boundary. So uh, it turns out that the decision boundary is actually uh, this function here. So h w comma b is equal to w transpose x to c is exactly the decision boundary. Okay. So the decision boundary is. Um, W transpose x plus b, uh, and so how is the boundary equal to this, right? So it's it's a function, it's a it's a linear function. Uh, so the decision boundary is basically whether uh, h w, you know, this W transpose x plus b is, is greater than zero or less than zero. Okay, so it's it's a h, h W transpose x plus b is like a line in two dimensions, or it could be a plane in multiple dimensions, and uh, it's just saying that hey, if you're above the plane. You are going to evolve there. If you are below the plane, you are going to be negative. So we are directly dealing with the expression of the decision boundary here. Okay. And uh, if you, if you kind of focus on these constraints, you can actually kind of. So what we can do with this expression is actually drop this c. This ci variable seem to be an extra variable, kind of making us not have good intuition. So what we're going to do is drop this ci. So if you just focus on uh, this, and we want to say, remember, we want to also want to minimize ci. I, I kind of drop the ci minimization here, but you also want to minimize ci. Okay, so they're called slack variables, but don't worry about the definition here. Uh, so we want to minimize ci, but you can see that either ci has to be greater than zero, or ci should be such that it's it's uh, somehow like this time left hand side should be less than sorry greater than or equal to one minus ci. Now what you can do with this is that you can just you can flip ci to the left hand left hand side and move this to the right hand side. Okay, so so there's one minus ci. Instead of that, you can move this whole left hand side to to right, and then ci if you move it to the left, it's going to become positive ci. Okay, so that you can see that so either ci is greater than one minus whatever is the left side, or ci is greater than zero. Okay. So either ci is greater than zero, or or thing here, which means that ci. Because we want to keep C as low as possible, it has to be equal to the maximum of either zero or one minus that. So it's just a trying to kind of get rid of C. That's what I'm trying to do. And I know that C has to be positive, or C has to be uh, at least you know so at least greater than one minus something. And I know I want to minimize C. So Z I, if I set it to be maximum of zero on this, then I'll be fine. So with that, uh, what I get is an actually an expression like this, and now we'll interpret this as a, uh, you know, closer to our uh, type of optimization problems that we're seeing. Okay, so type of unconstrained loss minimization problems that we're seeing. Okay, so in particular, our optimization problem, okay, is going to be unconstrained. There is no CI, so because we kind of condense these constraints to a constraints into which are all about CI as well as the W and B, but sorry, also about W and B. Uh, we kind of kind of get, we can get rid of the ci in the expression by just replacing this uh, ci in the objective with with this max of something, and so we just did that exactly. Okay, so ob objective is exactly the same as before. So minimize w comma b half of uh, some two norm square plus c times uh, sum of instead of ci, I just wrote max of zero comma one minus yi times um, this h of xi. So it's just a replacement. So this max was exactly this max here. Okay. So in that way, what happened in this expression is we dropped the constraint. Okay, we have already considered them, and ci is gone. Okay. Now, if you just focus on this expression, this by the way, if you didn't if you didn't follow like the first two points, just say that this is actually the optimization problem related to the Sobol vector machine. Okay. So this is what is called the primal optimization problem. But you know, let's not worry about primal uh, as a word. So it's just the optimization problem related to linear support vector machines, and in fact, you are working on it in assignment four. So behind the scenes, when you call SVC, uh, you know, like dot train or sorry dot fit, it's basically so essentially solving this. Okay. Um, now here you can uh, interpret a couple of things. Okay, so you can interpret uh, 
uh, firstly that uh, you know my hypothesis class is something like w transpose x plus b so it seems like okay hey this hypothesis class is going to produce real numbers right so every feature vector x w transpose x plus b is going to produce me a number right uh, it's a real number so it seems like hey how is this related classification but the answer is once you do w transpose x plus b if it's greater than zero then one class if it's less than zero the other class okay so threshold is kind of fixed unlike in assignment two where you had the linear regression and then you kind of choose some threshold like 0.5 or something like that right okay so that's your hypothesis class and these are these are your linear linear hypothesis class actually linear in x okay um so these um so it says here it's a set of uh, n dimensional hyperplane so yeah so because each one remember if x is um x is 10 dimensional then you know, this basically characterizes a hyperplane uh for example x is two dimensional uh then this characterizes a line uh equal to zero is, is a line sorry so if, if, if each hypothesis you said equal to zero will be the decision boundary so it's going to be a line in two dimension a plane in three dimensions and higher and so uh so that's the hypothesis class and also if you just look at this expression um uh, you'll see like a very non-standard loss function here okay so where why am i seeing the loss function you see that hey my, i'm making a prediction here h of xi is my prediction and ground truth is yi remember yi we are binary classification setting and i said yi can only take value plus 1 or minus 1 you know um, we kind of kind of fix that so this is somehow so so and there is also summation over i equal to 1 to m so it should be kind of if you do a template matching with square loss or um, you know cross entropy loss um, uh, that we saw before or logistic the logistic loss that we saw before then each term here so the term here max of 0 comma 1 minus something is like your loss function okay is is your loss function per example so the loss function delta of your you know actually let me say this should be prediction of prediction which is h of x i comma y i okay so this is not correct here there's a little bit of typo so h of x i and y i is equal to max of 0 comma 1 minus y i times h of x i so it's a very um uh you know very different looking loss function and uh, we'll not spend time on uh kind of looking at the loss function in a lot more detail but uh because objective here is to really say that hey there's a bunch of classifiers decision trees and support vector machines which really focus on decision boundaries okay um and so that's that's what i wanted to recap here um but if somebody asks you hey you know how much do you know about support vector machines is basically just this they have a little bit non standard loss function they work mostly you know at least the vanilla version will only work with binary classification where yi should be minus 1 plus 1 then this is literally the expression for the um uh, loss i'll briefly discuss this extra thing okay in the next next slide and we have actually done regularization in assignment 3 so you have a some sense of having this extra two norm square but we'll briefly discuss it but in terms of the loss itself uh it's not zero one loss it's not the misclassification loss it's not the logistic loss but it is it is still a binary classification related loss okay this this loss function here how is the loss function right so think of if my yi if i am a positive example if my h is going to produce negative number okay then i have a trouble okay so if my h is negative and yi is positive then um then this is a uh, one plus something and so max of 0 comma 1 plus something is a positive number so i'm losing point if my prediction is like not the same you know not in the same time as yi okay but what if it's positive and positive so let's say yi is positive and i'm also producing a number which is positive okay then what happens is you know this this number is going to be some positive number okay it could be greater than 1 it could be less than 1 but let's say it's it's, it's greater than 1 okay let's say i'm confident so it's greater than 1 so 1 minus that number could be negative then max of 0 comma that number is 0 so if i give the right sign so if if y is positive as long as h of uh, w comma b is gives predict gives a positive thing uh, and if it's large enough then i'll definitely have zero error zero loss but if it's not large enough then i'll have a little bit of loss like one minus something okay so that that's how you kind of rationalize why this makes some sense as a loss function Okay, so let's uh, uh, 
briefly discuss so my objective as I said was to really talk about decision boundaries focus in the decision trees and FPMs. But I want to briefly mention about this because uh, we only saw, at least in the lectures, we have not seen regularization much, except for in, in assignment three, you did regularize logic regression. Um, so this extra thing here, uh, two norm square. So this is like a two norm square, which is just the sum of the squares of the entries of W vector. Um, um, and then multiplied with one half just for, you know, it's just some constants, okay, it doesn't matter. Um, so we call this part the loss and this part the uh, basically a regularization, okay. It, this term basically penalizes certain hypothesis, okay. So which hypothesis does it penalize? Each hypothesis is defined by W and B. So it's basically saying, hey, some hypothesis which who have W's which have large numbers, I don't, I don't prefer them, okay. And forget about W being complex. Basically, if there's a hypothesis where uh, Ws are large, okay, each coordinate is like some large number, then it's not good. Okay. That's the, that's the penalty that we, we are we are imposing. In general, you can have anything, you know, much uh, other things, but uh, here, uh, for simplicity, this is just uh, um, only penalizing some hypothesis uh, hypotheses which are complex. Um, this actually has a, has a connection to a much broader idea um, which I guess I'll briefly mention next next slide um, but let's come back to okay we saw regularization we saw decision trees and support vector machines at least the objective function and defined a new type of loss uh, so how does it compare with decision trees right uh, so in terms of decision trees uh, it's similar because both are learning uh, kind of focused on this discriminating boundary boundaries directly okay uh, I'm going to contrast that with logic regression in a second where the focus was really about maximizing log likelihood or basically minimizing negative log likelihood. Okay. And there was a link function. Of course, they eventually will, will lead to a decision boundary. Okay. Logic regression also gives you a decision boundary. But really, the objective was to kind of um, uh, maximize log likelihood, likelihood there. Okay. Uh, so here, they both really focus on uh, discriminating uh, boundaries directly. And that's why the loss function is a little bit non standard. Uh, the difference is that. Um, decision trees have to kind of uh, prune okay or do early stopping or something like that that's the way they regularize uh, that's the way you kind of prevent overfitting basically uh, whereas svms you need to kind of uh, deal with this balancing uh, coefficient c okay so you can have a c here or you can have a c here i mean you'll have different interpretations but um, basically you need to kind of deal with the c here okay? that's the balancing coefficient between the loss and the regularization term any questions here? Okay, so they are. Uh, so let's talk about now switch gears and talk about uh, training uh, training classifiers in the sense that we're going to focus on the loss function. Okay. Um, so we have seen two types of models: decision trees and uh, support vector machines, different different objectives. Um, but you know, this is the third one, which is we learn the parameters that maximize the log likelihood. Um, which or maximizes the conditional log likelihood, conditional on the features. So in particular, general expression would be something like this. Okay, in fact, this is the expression for logistic regression or even multi-class logistic regression, which is basically probability of log of the probability of the true class given the feature vector. And so this is conditional on the feature vector, uh, which is not modeled. Okay, we are not thinking about the distribution over feature vectors. Okay? We are not thinking about distribution over axes. Okay, so this is the um, log likelihood and sum over all the m training observations, and you're maximizing this log likelihood over theta, the parameters of your uh, this conditional probability here, uh, belonging to some set theta. Okay. So some this capital theta here is just some collection of from which you can get these theta vectors. Okay. Uh, generally, for example, for logic regression, there is no there is no capital theta in the sense that it's quite broad. Okay, just pick any, you know, theta one can be any real number, theta two can be any real number, theta three can be any real number. Okay. So that's like saying, hey, this theta here, this capital theta here is a is R3 or something. R3 is just a real, you know, vector space in three dimensions, right? Um yeah, I guess I guess I just mentioned it here. Log function then log function then is the negative log likelihood. You either maximize log likelihood or minimize the negative of the log likelihood. And theta, as I said, is the logistic regression is just going to be the R n plus one. Okay, R n plus one is just where n is your 
uh, features and then plus one is for the default feature or like the intercept right when we created the uh, last coordinate to be ones or something so so that's the choice for logic regression and uh, if you briefly recall we also connected logic regression with this general general explanations on the idea and for all of them is the same template for all of them you're just going to define what is the conditional likelihood conditional log likelihood uh, sum them up and then you're going to maximize the conditional log likelihood or minimize the negative of the uh, log likelihood okay. so for in particular we're not going to recap general uh, sorry we're not going to recap generalized linear models here we've done quite a bit of quite a, quite a bit of time discussing that uh, but one of the recap by logic regression how does log, how does how does it work with logic regression okay so we started the bernoulli distribution uh, bernoulli distribution over the output okay so really we are again i want to kind of mention this now because we're going to talk about generative models in a second here it's discriminative because we're only focusing on the we're going to be only putting a distribution on the output okay the condition probability of y uh, actually condition probability of y given x okay yeah okay it has a parameter theta uh, sorry it has a parameter phi okay and that gives us a natural parameter which is this transformation of this um, uh, user parameter and then h theta of x uh, is Uh, if you remember, remember has to be uh, the expectation of the sufficient statistic, okay, uh, for 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 y and given x and theta, okay, and the sufficient statistic for logic regression happens to be y itself, okay? and so that's why t of y is y, and so this expectation of y given x comma theta, and this for Bernoulli sorry for binary uh, Bernoulli random variable expectation of y uh, given parameters is nothing but the probability of y is equal to one. Okay, because the other outcome is zero, so it's just the probability of y is equal to one uh, times one, which is you know times one is ignored, and so that is equal to exa exactly phi. Okay, so that probability of being one is exactly phi for Bernoulli, right? And that phi uh, we're gonna uh, relate it to eta because we know that the relation between eta and phi is like this, or if you want to write phi in terms of eta, it's like this. Okay, this is the link function or the um, uh, is the link function or the logistic function here. Okay. Logic function is the link function here. So one by one plus e to the power minus eta is the function. And uh, and so remember for for exponential family, we are further going to assume that eta is equal to zero times x. So that's why that's why the h theta of x is just one by one plus e to the power minus theta times x. And so just wanted to kind of elaborate that h theta of x for logic regression is is this. Okay. Whereas for supervised for this our SVM, h theta of x is directly something like w x plus b. Okay, it's a little bit different. Okay, and the likelihood function you can write it directly. It's just log of h theta of x to the power y i. If you remember, this was a nice form to say, hey, if y i is positive, then pick up this term. If y i is negative, or sorry, if y i is zero, then pick up this term. Now I've slightly changed the notation again. Y i can be only zero or one, not minus one or plus one. Um. So any questions in chat? No. Okay, so so if you really think of the uh, minimizing the negative log likelihood, then this is the loss function. I'm just trying to write loss functions in the previous like we saw addition tree, we didn't see the addition tree loss function, but we saw support vector machines loss function, and now we are seeing logistic regression loss function. So we just want to minimize theta again. Theta is kind of unconstrained, so we didn't write in uh, the set theta, Kaplan uh, theta, but this is the negative log likelihood. And uh, uh, and the addition boundary is given by uh, is actually not is, is given by comparing h theta of x, which is the number between zero and one, to some threshold. Okay, so that's where this is again comes back to that ROC curve where these logic regression model is producing a number, but you have to compare that number to some threshold, and only then you get hey this is positive, this is negative. Right? So Uh, and that's kind of capital here. H theta of x is just producing a number between zero and one, right? This is a number between zero and one always. And uh, so H is not a, you know, is not going to be, for example, this is certainly not linear. Actually, uh, this is a nonlinear function, right? Uh, sigmoid function. There's a linear function part here, and then it gets transformed to a nonlinear function. So eventually, get some number. Um, so our hypothesis. Class is actually this C function, okay. But the addition boundary 
sorry, actually, I think the sentence is not correct here. So, sorry, I should say the hypo. So, let's not use the addition boundary word here. H theta of x is this. Okay. So the collection of h, h you know, hypothesis functions we are looking at is just 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus theta runs to x. But to define the addition boundary, we need to say what is positive, what is negative. And therefore, we need to compare h theta of x. Uh, to be with some threshold. Okay. So I, I think that doesn't come across here. So drop the word addition model here. Um, okay. So don't worry about the midterm. Uh, this is a previous slide. Um, so, uh, but with the threshold and the set theta of x, we do get addition boundary. And it turns out that addition boundary is actually linear. Okay. So large regression also gives us a linear addition boundary. Very similar to SVM, which gives us linear addition boundary, and not similar to addition trees, which give us non-linear addition boundary. Okay. Um, so, but it does get us addition boundary by by minimizing negative log likelihood, negative conditional log likelihood, uh, which is like basically this probability of y given x at the parameter theta. Okay, and we are we are, we are minimizing by trying to pick uh, the parameter theta. Okay. So, any can any questions? Sorry about the word addition boundary here, but h theta of x is not is just the predictor function. And hash theta of x compared to some threshold is the, is going to give you the position one. Okay, so we have already done this, but there's a recap. So in assignment three, you got to play with regularized logic regression. So where you are having the usual negative log likelihood. Okay, this part. So you you are actually minimizing this. Plus a regularization term, you know, plus C, C is just a regularization coefficient. Uh, remember, you're searching over it. Uh, so C times uh, some two norm square over the theta. Okay. So two norm square is very similar to like regularizing the sum of squares of the entries uh, of the theta value. Okay. This should not be shocking or new to you guys. <laughs> this is something that we did in assignment, right? which you've already submitted actually. Um, Okay, so basically, what we did is take the original logic regression problem, added a penalty, okay, and that's what you can do even with circuit learn. Uh, you can actually choose a penalty. Uh, typically, L2 penalty exactly means this, okay, and choose the penalty's uh, weight, for example, the C here. And so, we can explicitly add that, okay, that doesn't come from uh, the log likelihood expression that we saw earlier. Okay. Log likelihood was not, was only this part, but this part, regularization, you can motivate it. But for now, let's just assume that it's a uh, it's a user-defined term, as in like it's it's based on domain knowledge. That I want, I prefer thetas which have low two norm squares. That's what that's what this is doing. Okay, because I'm minimizing all theta, so I want those thetas which kind of have low value for this and low value for the negative negative log likelihood. Okay, and so if you if you use theta two norm square, then it's called ridge. ridge. I guess ridge. Uh, I guess ridge regression or ridge logic logic regression in our case. Okay. If you just do two norm square with the original least square subjective, then it's called ridge regression. And if you do it for the original, uh, you do one norm, one norm, or one one norm with uh, the original least square subjective, it's called last regression. Okay. So let, let's not worry about this sentence here because it doesn't um, apply to classification. And uh, just to mention that if you just focus on last function, it's called empirical risk minimization. Uh, and if you add this uh, regularizer, um, it's called structural risk minimization. Okay, so these words actually uh, are not super important. There is actually, uh, uh, you know, what is precisely empirical risk minimization and what is precisely structural risk minimization is beyond the scope of this course. Uh, but basically, you know, what we want to motivate is that you can add regularizers, regularizers. Okay, even even when you're even when you're minimizing the negative log like you Okay. So I wanted to just cover that and now talk about generative models. So uh, let's uh, do that. So discriminative models are looking at, you know, are making some assumptions. IID data, data is like this, XI, YI pair drawn from some unknown fixed distribution. And I have M examples. And I, uh, I want to consider finding a, you know, function which discriminates basically. You know, creates the decision boundary and therefore discriminates between positives and negatives, for example, uh, from a function class or a collection of hypotheses, which is script H. Okay. 
And the script hedge can be obtained either by just focusing on directly minimizing the loss or with an extra regularizer if you want. Okay. So that's uh, uh, what we do. And this process either directly focuses on getting a addition boundary, a linear addition boundary. Uh, sorry, this is again swap. So it should be loss regression or vanilla SEM. Okay, so the first example should be loss regression or vanilla vanilla SEM. So they give you a linear addition boundary, or you can find a nonlinear addition boundary, which is uh, by addition trees. Addition trees, if you remember, can create all sorts of addition boundary, even in two dimension. And then there's something called kernel SEM. Okay, we have not covered it in our in the in the class, at least this class. So if you've seen SEMs, or you know you're looking at SN4. Uh, there's a choice for you know if you look at the circuit learn documentation there's a choice where it says kernel is equal to linear or polynomial or uh, something else okay? exponential and so on uh, by default it's linear so that corresponds to the loss function that we saw in the you know two slides ago uh, but otherwise if you choose a uh, different kernel you know this is an option and we have we are not going to discuss that in this, this lecture and then it's going to give you a nonlinear addition boundary okay so addition trees and uh, kernel SEM provide nonlinear addition boundary. Okay. Um, so, but we want to kind of uh, make this final statement before talking about generative models is that uh, finding addition boundaries between classes, between the two classes, three classes, whatever they are, is equal to directly learning uh, the conditional property of y given x in most cases. Okay. So we are really focusing on just the conditional distribution of y given x. Although we can, we you know, we, we can assume that there is a joint distribution with x and y, we're not really interested in finding the joint distribution. Okay, conditional distribution, distribution and joint distribution have a difference, which is that given the joint distribution, I can derive a conditional distribution easily. Okay, because you know, if you tell me the joint distribution, I can tell you what the conditional distribution of, you know, x given y is or y given x is. But given just the conditional distribution, I can't tell you what the joint distribution is. So joint distribution has more information, more assumptions built in, or or or. Or, or more information basically. But anyway, what I want to say with this is that uh, in most cases, uh, discriminatory models are mostly focused on just this conditional distribution. Uh, sometimes you don't even have a conditional distribution. For example, with support vector machines, uh, they are not producing the, they are not producing a probability of some class. They are just saying here's a threshold, here is a you know W X plus B is W X plus B uh, line or or hyperplane. If that value is greater than zero or less than zero, you are in class one or class two. Okay. So they're not giving you a probability. At least all iteration is producing a probability. With addition trees, you can you know massage it into essentially a probability if you want. Uh, but they're also producing you know either a class one or class zero, for example. So not all of them produce uh, conditional probabilities. But you can think of hey, if you have addition boundary, you can kind of think of that I do have a access to some sort of a conditional distribution. Okay. It's not it's not correct. This last statement, but approximately, you know, it will make sense. Right? Any any questions? I don't want to confuse you guys with uh, the last point. I'm just saying that this makes sense for uh, logic regression, but doesn't make too much sense for SVMs or decision trees without some extra things which we did not discuss. Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about the generative version of the same thing. So let's say we have uh, it's all the same thing. Our data. Uh, join from some unknown distribution uh, p of x comma y, and instead of rather you know finding the decision boundary directly, okay, we instead of focusing on decision boundary, which you know uh, in classification, we actually care about modeling the distribution of individual classes. Okay. This is a different way of saying we want to focus on the joint distribution of x and y. We're just saying that generative models model the distribution of individual classes. So it's just saying Hey, given a class under class one, how does my distribution of my features look like? Under class two, how does the distribution of my features look like? Okay, that's what that's what this sentence means here. Okay, so let's actually look at it a uh, little bit more. So let's say we want to classify cats versus dogs. Okay, so cats are positive and dogs are negative. Then let's say there's a. Uh, so what we want is actually in generative models. What we not want, but we what we also kind of get, or what we also model. Is the distribution of dog features and distribution of cat features. So we are actually doing extra, uh, which may or may not be needed, but we are actually uh, modeling these extra conditional probabilities. Okay. So 
uh, and also so not just these two, but also how many cats and how many dogs were there in general, which is probably a wise zero, probably wise zero. But you can already see right with these, you know, this marginal distribution. This is called a marginal probability. Okay, marginal because if the original thing was a joint distribution in x and y, this quantity is only involving one of the random variables y, and that's why it's called a marginal. And these types of expressions are called conditional probabilities. Clearly, there are two random variables. One is fixed, and the other one is, uh, you know, on the left-hand side. So, um, so these are this is called a conditional. This is a marginal. But you can already see that if I have a margin, if I have a conditional probability and a marginal probability, if I multiply them together, I'll get the joint probability. So, p of x given y times p of y is equal to p of x times y. Okay, that's a basic expression, right? So, which means that I'm really Talking about the joint distribution between x and y. Any questions here? Um, so, if you think of the uh, distribution of x, okay, so uh, for simplicity, uh, so uh, just to kind of get a sense of what is the marginal distribution of x, is the sum of y is equal to 0 and 1. So, since you are in the binary case, binary classification case, binary value case, okay, y only takes value 0 or 1 of this joint distribution, okay. Now, this joint distribution can be split as probability of x given y times probability of y. Right? This is exactly what we mentioned earlier. And that for binary case will be probability of x given y is equal to 1 times probability of y is equal to 1 plus probability of x is equal to x given y is equal to 0 times probability of y is equal to 0. So, this is just the expanding whatever we wrote here. The reason why we wrote this uh, expression, this uh, long expression, is that we uh, for so is that you know given these distributions we can certainly get the marginal distribution of x so we are actually modeling the mo modeling the feature modeling a distribution of features okay that's what we want to say with this line okay not much so compared to think of discriminator setting we are thinking of probability of y given x pretty much that's it here because we are doing extra stuff like distribution of sorry distribution of uh, individual classes or whatever we you know what we said here we actually have a handle on the not just the joint distribution, but also everything else that we can derive from it, including, for example, the marginal distribution of x. Okay. But for prediction, what do we do? For prediction, we actually, uh, you know, let's say y hat is our prediction, is the arg max of all the y's, uh, which is exactly the same as before, okay. probability of y given x. This is exactly, so given a feature vector x, I want to find that y, which is the highest like, uh, high li which, is the, which is most likely. Right. This is what we've been doing, even for logical logic regression okay. or multi-class logic regression. So exactly the same thing. Now, but the change is that this probability of y given x, we're going to convert it back uh, into uh, the following expression. So probability of y given x is probability of x given y times probability of y. This is numerator is nothing but the joint distribution between x and y divided by the probability of x. Okay. Why is that? That part is base rule. Okay. So all you know, you don't even have to think of base rule. You can just think of probability of y given x times probability of x is equal to what? Probably the joint distribution between x and y. And probability of x given y times probability of y is just the joint distribution between x and y. So, it's, so this term here and this ratio here are the same. Okay. And so instead of that term, we put the ratio here. And then we observe that when you're trying to maximize our y, the denominator has nothing to do with y. Okay. And so we can drop the denominator. And you say, hey, for my prediction, I'm going to say, hey, find the y that maximizes this product. Okay. And this product is very different from the conditional probability that we've been seeing for discriminative models. Okay. For discriminative models, we're directly predicting what is the probability of y given x. And we don't care about the distribution of x. Here, we do care about distribution of x. We are saying, hey, I care about the marginal distribution of y. And under each class, what does x look like? What does the distribution of x look like? Okay. It's a little bit. So it's just using base rule and a little bit of manipulation, but it's just a way of thinking. We are modeling more. So just we are modeling the joint distribution of x and y. Okay, that's so if we, you know, we these two last lines are just doing some manipulation here. But what I'm trying to say is that we, since we model x joint distribution x and y, the way we, um, um, in particular, this slide is saying that in, in the joint distribution between x and y, we are actually modeling the conditional probability of features given labels and uh, the marginal distribution of y. In particular, um, any questions in the audience? No. So, 
uh, when I when I keep saying, "Hey, we are modeling the generalization x and y," what I want to say, and let me uh, summarize it here, is that we are modeling the conditional probability of class, conditional probability features given class. Because if I know the conditional probability features given class and the marginal probabilities of class, that is the joint distribution between x and y. Okay. So whenever I say joint distribution x and y, I am really focusing on this this conditional probability, probability of the features given class. And of course, the marginal problem. Okay, so yeah, so with that, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, mathematical like expressions in the previous slide. Let's briefly uh, discuss uh, discriminative versus generative models. Uh, discriminative models, just in finding the discriminative discriminating distribution boundary. Okay, really, which what is the boundary which kind of puts apples away from oranges, right? Uh, directly model the conditional probability of y given x. Okay. And make a prediction. Uh, classification performance generally pretty good, uh, and uh, pretty good only because it's making less assumptions than the generative model bonding approaches. Okay, so it's in that sense it's more robust. Okay, knowledge segregation is more robust than something called uh, Gaussian discriminant analysis or linear discriminant analysis that we'll see next lecture. Okay, uh, so so less assumptions, but performance is better because it's you know even if the assumption is uh, slightly off, it's, it's okay. Uh, and con is nothing much is learned about the uh, about each class. Okay, we don't learn about anything about the features given the class. I mean, there's nothing in that you have to do extra work to find out, learn anything more. Whereas with uh, generative models, uh, we are interested in learning the joint distribution, which is the same as learning the distribution of individual classes. Okay, which is the same as saying I want to I want to learn the conditional probability of x given y. Okay, the first sentence is saying that uh, probability of x given y and probability of y, which is just the class proportions basically. And then a prediction is via base rule. I mean, we are using the word base rule here, but it's just our prediction is based on what we saw in the previous slide, right? So a prediction is based on this class conditional probability of the feature times the marginal. Okay, and that turns out to be base rule as well. So. Um, and the pro is we learn something about each class so because we know the conditional probability of features given uh, under each class. Uh, and so, and so, if that actually is the right assumption to make in your data, this approach performs better. But of course, if you make the wrong choice, you know it's a double-edged sword. So if you make the wrong choice, you know you're making an assumption about the conditional probability of x given y, uh, let's say being normal, and it's not normal but some other distribution, then you'll be off. Okay, you'll degrade the prediction quality. So you're making more assumptions. So if the assumption doesn't suit the data, then you'll be better uh, than not making that assumption. But of course, if the assumption doesn't suit the data, then you're off. Okay, so that's kind of expected. Right? Um, so actually, in, in the slides, multivariate Gaussian review is not there. So actually, let's skip that. Um, so what we're going to do is. Uh, Briefly look at uh, parameter estimation. Okay, uh, I'll actually skip the general formulation, which is which appears in the next couple of slides, and I'll look at for uh, a particular distribution. Okay, so we have done parameter estimation before. If you remember for Bernoulli, even in assignment two, there was a question which was like, "Hey, maximum likelihood of uh, theta to the power three times one minus theta to the power seven, right?" Uh, that was essentially parameter estimation for a for a binomial. Uh, for a binomial, uh, sorry, for a Bernoulli random variable. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's the same type of expression for, even for Bernoulli, uh, binomial as well. Uh, so today, what we'll do is, given the limited time, we'll look at a, a estimation of uh, a, what is a distribution called the multinomial distribution. Okay. Uh, just corresponds to multi-class classification. Um, so let's do that. And actually, don't worry about the remaining three topics. We'll actually pick them up. Next lectures, okay. So next couple of lectures, yeah. This nine base is a type of a generative model. Right? Yes, nine base is a generative model. Hidden Markov model is a generative model. Linear discriminant analysis or Gaussian discriminant analysis is a generative model. Yeah, they're all generative models. Then we did nine base in five seventy two. Five seventy two. Yeah. 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 It's a generative model, and you'll see. I mean, basically, it is exactly doing this. Uh, what what we just discussed. Uh, P of x. Yeah. P of x given y is model. In fact, naive base has assumption that p of x given y kind of has a product form. That's the assumption there. But we'll we'll see when we get there. So 
Um, so let's look at uh, some parameter estimation just as a recap. Okay, this is again we've done it before at least uh, in assignment as well as well as in the lecture. But kind of uh, the reason why we're doing it is kind of is this time there's going to be a little bit of change in how we do the estimation for logic regression or for let's say Bernoulli, it was an unconstrained optimization problem. Okay, because we said theta, uh, it was not really exactly unconstrained. We wanted theta to be between zero and one. Right? Remember in, in the in the assignment we were doing maximize theta to the power 3, 1 minus theta to the power 7, we just wanted theta to be between 0 and 1. Okay. But we didn't, you know, the way to optimize it like is just to ensure that theta is like not less than 0 or not greater than 1. But beyond that, we didn't do much. Okay. Um, but the moment you have uh, a multi-class situation, uh, sorry, um, a multinomial situation or a categorical distribution, there, there's a little bit of uh, extra thing that, that happens, which is that there's a constraint. Okay. And we'll see that. Uh, now, so yeah, so let's say uh, we have coin flips, even in the example from assignment or as well as lecture. Uh, so we have a training data head sales, head, head sales, head. Our model is our model parameter is t, okay, probability of heads. Then the likelihood is basically just hey, there how many heads happened? Four, how many tails happened? Two, and so it's t times one minus t uh, with this, this expression, okay, this is the likelihood. Now the reason why we wrote c to the power four and one minus c. Okay, so it's kind of if you remember, like there could be two parameters, right? So it could have been uh, c one and c two, but the sum to one. Okay, that could have been a constraint. Instead of that, we said, hey, p two is actually equal to one minus c, and let's just directly put that here, and let's not talk, worry about the probability of the second class, second uh, outcome. And so that's a nice trick here, but you know that can only happen with, you know, that can only happen here. And so we'll see how how we'll deal with in the multi output case, multi outcome case. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. So so okay, this is exactly the assignment question. Instead of four and two, there were three and seven there. But basically, we are doing odd max of this f f of uh, this variable, where the variable had to be between zero and one. Okay. And how do you do it? Uh, you know, just take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you want to do it uh, manually, of course, in the assignment, I believe you you guys said gradient, gradient descent or gradient ascent to do this. Uh, but if you just do it, take the derivative and equal to zero, you will be able to find uh, the solution here, a good uh, an estimate of the parameter. Okay, so take the derivative. Uh, so you get some very very messy expression here, uh, this expression here, uh, and then if you set it equal to zero, it's just some polynomial equal to zero here. Uh, 2 to phi is q plus 1 minus phi and something else is equal to 0. And so eventually you get something, you know, you, you get phi to be two thirds. Okay, that's the right choice for which uh, where the gradient is equal to 0. So, oh, sorry, uh, is the, yeah. It's not gradient equal to 0. So let's, let's drop uh, this, yeah. So 1 minus phi times 2 minus 3 phi. So two minus three phi, where you substitute two by three, is going to be two minus two. It's going to be zero. So you can see that the gradient is zero over there. And it just you can also check that gradient is negative. Uh, sorry, gradient is positive when you're when you when you're going to the left of two by three, and gradient is again uh, you know like it's basically a hump like this. So your you have uh, yeah your 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 function is uh, increasing before the hump, and your function is decreasing after the hump. Then therefore you have a Kind of a going up and going down phenomena going on here, and so you have an optimum. Okay, and this is something important we have to check. But gain descent so far in the assignment and so on, we haven't been checking this uh, much. Okay, so which is that um, you know gain descent itself will try to descend to an optima, uh, but here, oh, sorry, with uh, with uh, hand derived things like this, you have to check that you are actually setting derivative equal to zero is fine. You know, find some solution. But you want to say that the solution is actually the maximum or the minimum, right? Because it could be that the solution could be not the not what you expect. Like instead of maximizing that that particular solution could be minimizing your objective. Okay. Because gain can be if you have a sinusoid type of thing, that there, there are two places where gain is zero, but one of them is maximizing the function, the other one is minimizing the function. Okay. Um, just be careful about that. Um see how much time do we have? Um Okay, so let me actually not cover the multi class multi class case today um, and, and just wrap up here. So 
uh, option two is what you could have also done, which is which is actually uh, even asked in the assignment, I, I believe. So instead of maximizing this, uh, you know, very you know something to the power of four and something else to the power of two, you can take a log of this objective. Okay, log of this objective is four log phi plus two log one minus phi. Right. I mean that's kind of expression. You know, log of a times b is log of a plus log of b, and log of a to the power x is uh, x log a. Right. So that's fine. And then you can just maximize this g function. Okay. So, um, so if you maximize this g function again, take the gradient of this g function. That will be uncertainty equal to zero. That will be four times log of t is like one by t is the gradient. Um, minus two by one minus t. Okay. This minus here is because there's a minus in front of the t here. And so if you solve this again, you get two by three. Okay. So there are two ways to not two ways, but like I mean, if you had an original objective function, if you apply a monotonic function on it, okay, a monotonic function just means that um, in the original function, if think of an original function right f of phi, if f of uh, so let's say take two values c one and p two, okay, if f of phi one is less than f of phi two, if you take an extra function like log. And apply it to f of e1 and f of e2, the inequality is in the same direction. So in the sense that if originally f of e1 is smaller than f of e2, then log of f of f of e1 should be smaller than f of log of f. So that's like a it doesn't change the order. It doesn't flip. You know, if something was smaller before, it doesn't kind of uh, make it uh, the opposite. Okay. So so that with that transformation, the optimal solution is the same. Okay? In the sense that the thing that maximizes the original function. I think that maximizes the log of that original function. They are the same solution. Okay, two by three and two by three. Okay? And you can see that one maybe in one case it's a little bit easier than the other because in one case you have to look at polynomials like this. The other case it seems uh, you know it's just an easier expression here. Um, yeah. So what I want to do, uh, let me wrap up here. What I want to do next class is uh, talk about. Uh, um, a little bit more about generative models, okay? And you saw some examples, Naibase and Gaussian discriminant analysis and so on. But also briefly talk about this conditional, uh, sorry, uh, this constraint optimization business. Okay? Uh, the thing is that what we did here with the Bernoulli case, uh, sorry, yeah, this Bernoulli case doesn't extend the moment you have uh, three outcomes, okay, or four outcomes. Okay, the same. It's not going to be an unconstrained. It's not going to be a Easy, con easily constrained optimization problem. Here it's an easy constraint because you just want to ensure that phi is between zero and one. It's kind of an easy constraint. You know, you just just uh, forget about between zero and one. You just try to set the gradient to zero, and just it happens that uh, the solution is between two, you know, between zero and one. Okay. But what if you have an explicitly, you know, you'll see that for beyond the binary outcome, like instead of a coin flip, if you had uh, a roll of a die or something which is like multi-valued, then you will have a constraint here, and you'll see how to deal with the constraint in the beginning of next lecture, and then talk about Mayways, uh, linear discriminant analysis, and so on. Okay. So, um, any questions here? So, if not, uh, let's break for today and uh, let's resume. Let's resume uh, two weeks from now. So, don't forget that the assignment of four is due. Uh, soon, okay, uh, soon after the break. So if you can do it before the break and take a break, then that's better. Okay.